Hello everyone, it's me Uncle John. Today I am going to read S6 6066 Nelson Mandela Chapter 7 Prison and Separation It was a hard and lonely life on Robben Island for the prisoners so far so far away from their friends and family. Mandela said that prison was like a A fire that tested tested a man. Some became stronger, and others became less than they had been before. In the 1970s, sometimes the prisoners were taken to work at the beach. They pulled long, heavy plants from the sea onto the beach and left them to dry. Then they packed them onto the back of a truck. In the summer, the sea was enjoyable, but in the winter, the water was icy cold. However, the prisoners were glad to see the trail, tall buildings of Cape Town across the sea, and they watched the clouds and sunshine moving across the flat table mountain, which stood more than 1,000 meters high behind the city. The island was also home to groups of African penguins, and the prisoners <coughs> enjoyed watching the fat black and white birds on the beach. The prisoners were also able to catch fish and cook them on the beach. In 1975, Mandela's daughter, Jinji, came with Winnie to visit him on Robben Island. The last time he had seen her, she was a little girl of three. Now she was a young woman of 15. She was shy. Towards the father, she did not remember, but Mandela talked to her about the days when she was a baby. Nelson and Winnie decided to send their two daughters to school in Swaziland, where they could be safe from the police. Mandela worried about this because he knew that the love of her daughters helped Winnie to survive. That year, Mandela decided to write the story of his life. For four months, Mandela slept for only a few hours as he wrote for most of the night. Each day, Kastrada and Sesulu wrote notes on the pages he had written. Another prisoner, Ralu Chiba, copied the pages in his very small writing, putting 10 pages onto one small piece of paper. And Mac Maharaji hid the small copied pages in the books he was studying. When Maharaji was released from prison in 1976, he took these pages with him, and he kept them safe after he escaped from South Africa. Mandela used these pages when he wrote the full story of his life, Long Walk to Freedom. The prisoner secretly buried the 500 pages that Mandela had written, with the notes written on them by Sisulu and Katsurada in three different places in the prison garden. However, a few weeks later, when a wall was built in the garden, a packet of pages was discovered by the prison guards. The prison officials punished Mandela, Sisulu, Katsurada. They were forbidden to study for four years. Prisoners thought everybody escaped all the time they were in prison. And in 1974, Maharaj and Mandela had planned to escape when they were taken to see a doctor in Cape Town. But they were surrounded by guards with guns all the time. They had to forget their plan. Prisoners always believed they were going to be free one day Mandela believed that more than anyone else, the 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 Fikil Bam said that Mandela believed that he was going to play an important part in bringing freedom to South Africa. While on Robben Island, Mandela learned to speak Afrikaans, and he talked to the guards in Afrikaans. He wanted to understand the Afrikaners because he believed they were part of South Africa. In the 60s and 70s, about 26% of Africans did not have jobs. White miners were earning more than 20 times what African miners were earning. The 1970s were years of change in South Africa. Though the prisoners did not immediately hear about these changes, in 1972, the Black Consciousness Movement was started by Steve Biko and other young black leaders. The Black Consciousness Movement was very popular with teachers and students. Its young leaders wanted to make black people proud of their own history. 
and to help them to work together. In 1976, 15,000 black school children marched to Soweto to protest against the new law. The teachers in African schools must use the African language. Police began to shoot at the crowd, and several children were killed. During the next year, thousands of black children refused to go to school. More than 600 children were killed by police on the streets of the townships, and thousands more were arrested. Winnie Mandela was one of the black leaders who helped parents and families in the townships at this time. She was arrested in 1976, while her daughters were in Swaziland and imprisoned in the fort Johannesburg for five months. In May 1977, after she was released, 20 policemen arrived at her home in Orlando West. Zinji was at home with Winnie, and the police began to pack their furniture and clothes into a truck. They drove Winnie and Zinji to an African township called uh, the Brantford, nearly 5,500 kilometers away. Winnie and Zinji were left there in a small house without water or electricity. And Winnie was forbidden to leave Brand Brantford for seven years. People in the township spoke a language called uh, Sesotho, which Winnie did not know, but while she was there, she studied a school for young children and she helped to start a hospital for African. In the 1960s and 70s, the government forced more than 6 million Africans to move from their homes to the Bantustans, where there was not enough land for them to grow food. They came with guns and police. They brought us here. We do not know this place. What can we do now? We can do nothing. These were the words of some of the people who were forced to move to the Bantustans. In the 70s, white men in South Africa lived to the age of about 65 years. 65 years. African men could expect to live to the age of about 50 years. In September 1977, Steve Biko was arrested in Port Elizabeth and badly beaten by police. As he lay unconscious in the back of a truck, the police drove him more than 1,000 kilometers north to Pretoria prison, where he died. During the next few weeks, the police arrested every leader of the Black Conscious Movement. Some of these prisoners were taken to Robben Island, and for the first time, Mandela contacted the new young African leaders. They sent secret notes to each other, and some of these young men joined the ANC. In 1977, the work at the quarry ended. More guards were needed to control the younger prisoners. And Mandela and his group were now left in their own cells, where they could read, study, and write letters. Mandela also walked in the garden he had made. He grew tomatoes and vegetables and gave some of them to the prison guards. Mandela had always enjoyed sport. While in prison, he ran every morning in his cell for 45 minutes. At this time, one of the guards made a tennis court in the prison, and uh, Mandela began to play tennis with the other prisoners. In 1978, Mandela's daughter, Zeni, married the Prince Dumbumuzi uh, Dlamini, the brother of King Muswati III of Switzerland. They had met while Zeni was at school in Switzerland, Later that year, Jenny visited her father with her husband and baby daughter. It was the first time that the prison had allowed Jenny to visit her father since he went to prison 14 years earlier. They were allowed to meet face to face. Mandela was able to kiss his daughter and hold his granddaughter in his arms. I don't think a man was ever happier to hold a baby than I was that day. He wrote afterwards. He chose the name Jajiwi for the baby, which means hope. The name had a special meaning for me, Mandela wrote. But during all my years in prison, hope never left me. Now it never would. He believed that this child would be part of a new South Africa and that for her apartheid would be part of so history. In 1980, the prisoners were allowed to read some newspapers. However, the prison officials went through the papers, 
first and cut out any stories they did not want the prisoners to see, including news of the Free Mandela campaign. The ANC leader, Oliver Tambo, who was still living outside South Africa, started this campaign. When South African newspaper had the story, Free Mandela and pictures of Mandela were put up in London, now the cities of the world. The South African government was becoming unpopular all over the world. It was 20 years since the shooting at uh, Sharpville and Jinji Mandela spoke at a meeting of white students. I have not joined you as a daughter calling for the release of a father. I have joined as part of my generation who have never known what a normal life is. The United Nations also called on the South African government to release Mandela and the other political prisoners. One day in March 1982, Mandela was told to pack his thing. He was leaving the island, with no time to say goodbye to their companions of 18 years. Mandela, Walter Sisulu, Raymond Mulaba, and Andrew Mulanjeni were put on the boat to Cape Town. They had no idea where they were going. Mandela looked back at the island. As the sun went down, it was not a place that he liked, but it was a place that he knew. He wondered if he would ever see it again. The prisoners were taken from the boat and driven to the Portsmouth prison, a few kilometers outside Cape Town, where Ahmed Kathrada joined them a few months later. The Portsmouth prison was a modern prison, and Mandela and the others were the only political prisoners there. They were given a large room to share on the third floor with real bed, a separate bathroom, and a large open place on the roof where they could walk during the day. Mandela soon studied a garden here and he walked in it every day. He grew vegetables which he gave to the prison kitchen and to some of the guards. Although conditions in Polsmo were more comfortable than Robben Island, they were given better food. It was a world without trees. The men missed their own cells. They missed their other companions in the sea and the birds of Robben Island. In 19... 84, when Winnie visited him in Baltimore, the guards took her into a visiting room where Mandela was waiting. There was no glass wall between them. For the first time for 21 years, Mandela was able to kiss his wife and put his arms around her. Walking to Freedom, Chapter 8 Mandela and the other men had been in prison for more than 20 years, and many of their friends were now dead. The Reverend Fisher became very ill while he was in prison. He was released in 1975 and died soon afterwards. Robert Sobuku died in 78 at the early age of 54. The Griffiths, uh, 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 Xinji, a lawyer who was part of the Free Mandela campaign, was murdered in 1981. In 1982, Ruth Firth, the wife of Joe Slobo, was killed by a bomb in Maputo, Mozambique where she was living. Joe Gukabi, who had been in prison for, on Robben Island for many years with Mandela, was also murdered in 1981. There was more and more violence in South Africa. MK's sabotage of railway lines and apartheid offices also increased. The government tried to introduce a new separate parliament, parliament for the Indian and colored people, but more than 80% of Indian and colored vote, but was refused to vote in this election. World opinion against apartheid was growing. In 1984, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, the famous South African church leader, was given the Nobel Peace Prize. Archbishop Tutu was born in Transvaal in 1931, the son of a teacher. In 1975, he began to speak out against apartheid when he became the first African leader of the South African Council of Churches. He called for equal rights for everyone and for non-violent protest by black South African. He wanted other countries to stop buying anything from South Africa to force the government to change. In America, Jesse Jackson and the black leaders spoke against the apartheid system. Edward Kennedy, John F. Kennedy's brother, visited South Africa and went to meet Winnie Mandela in Brentford, though he was not allowed to visit Mandela himself. But Minister of Justice, Kobe Kwasi allowed Lord Bethel and Professor Dash uh, to visit Mandela in prison. 
in order to prove to the world that Mandela was in good health. Mandela told both these visitors that he wanted a free and equal country, where all adults were able to vote for the government. He explained that if the government changed, the ANC would stop the use of violence. After he returned to Europe, the Lord Bethel asked the government of Europe to persuade the South African government to free Mandela. In January 1985, President Botha stood up in parliament and offered Mandela his freedom if he stopped using violence. Mandela heard this on the radio and he immediately replied. When Winnie visited him, he gave the words he had written. His daughter Jinji had read her father's words to a crowd in Soweto Stadium. For the first time for more than 20 years, the people of South Africa heard the words of Mandela. I am a member of the African National Congress. I've always been a member of the African National Congress, and I will remain a member of the African National Congress until the day I die. He asked President Botha to give up violence by putting up putting an end to apartheid. Apartheid, and he wouldn't take this freedom that was offered to him. How could he be free when the people's organization, the ANC, was banned? How could he be free if he or anyone else had to carry a pass? He refused to make any promises. His final words to the people were, Your freedom and mine cannot be separated. I will return. Later that year, while Mandela was ill in hospital, Kobe Kweski, who seemed to be a kind of new, new kind of Africana leader, came to visit him. From the beginning, Kweski saw him as a future president. Although Mandela was a prisoner, wearing hospital clothes, he was a natural leader and full of dignity from the time Kweski wanted everyone to know that he was valuable. But when, but when Mandela was sent to Portsmouth prison, he was put by himself in a different part of the prison. Mandela protested to the prison official that his new cell was dark and cold. If Mandela wanted to see the other political prisoners, he had to ask for a meeting. They met in the visitor's room where the guards listened to their conversation. Early 1986, a group of important world leaders led by General Obasanjo of Nigeria and Malcolm Fraser of Australia arrived in South Africa to report to their governments on the situation in the country. For the first time since 1964, Mandela wore a suit instead of his prison uniform. Kobe Kweski joined the meeting between Mandela and the group, and Mandela told him that the time had come to negotiate. However, the day before the group were going to meet Mandela for the second time, President Botha ordered bombs to be dropped on ANC soldiers in Botswana, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. The group left South Africa immediately, but Mandela began to have secret talks with Kobe Kweski, Kwesi, the violence in South Africa continued to get worse. By the 1980s, South Africa had the highest number of people punished by death of any country in the world. Crowded houses in the towns and in the Bantustans caused many Africans to die from serious illness. For example, in the 1980s, 75% of people ill with TB were African, and only 1% were white. In the 80s, there was one doctor for every 300 white people. For African, the situation was very different. There was one doctor for 90,000 people. In July 1988, Mandela's 70th birth birthday was remembered around the world with more calls for his freedom, but it was a difficult time for Mandela. He learned that his home in Orlando West had been burned down. Many old photographs and other valuable personal things were lost. Mandela also had a problem with his chest and he often felt ill. At last, a doctor came to see him, said he was seriously ill. He was taken to hospital where doctors said that probably because of his cold cell, he was suffering from TB. After some weeks in hospital, Mandela began to get better. In 1988, December, he was moved to live in a prison guard's house in Victor Vasto Prison near Cape Town. On his first day in the house, the Kobe Kwesi visited him and brought him 
some bottles of wine as a present. Kwasi told him that it just would be his last home before he became a free man. Later, speaking of his release from prison, Nelson Mandela said that he was helped when preparing for his release by the story of Pandit Nehru, who wrote about what happens when you leave prison. In Victor Vesta, Mandela was allowed to live a more normal life. He was visited by a member of the ANC, other freedom groups, as well as by members of his family. In 1989, on his 71st birthday, five birthday, he had a birthday party and his wife, children, grandchildren were all allowed to come. It was the first time in his life that he had been able to have his whole family with him. In 1989, the clerk became president of South Africa. Nobody knew much about the clerk, who was Minister of Education and had been in political life since 1972, but he, he soon showed everyone that he wanted to change the situation in South Africa. In October, he told the parliament that the Baltimore political prisoners and several other uh, Robben Island prisoners were going to be released. The Walter Sisulu, Raymond Olaba, Ahmed Katrada, and Andrew Mulanjani were brought from Pulsma to say goodbye to Mandela. They all knew that Mandela would soon be released too. The men were taken to Johannesburg and then released. A crowd of 80,000 people in Suero welcomed the prisoners back home. The crowd sang the band ANC song, Nkosi Shi Kerler i Africa. In February 1990, President Dick Clark told the parliament that the band on the ANC, the PAC, and the Communist Party were going to be lifted and the political prisoners released. At last, the time to negotiate had arrived. On 10th February, Mandela was taken to meet President de Clark, who told him that he was going to be released the next day. Mandela telephoned Winnie Walter Sisulu in Johannesburg. They immediately flew to Cape Town. Mandela was only able to sleep for a few hours at night. On 11th February 1999, as the world watched on t the TV, Mandela walked with dignity towards the gate of Victor the first prison. He was tall, handsome, and looked younger than his 71 year olds. 71 years. He smiled at the waiting crowd as he walked to freedom. As I finally walked through those gates to enter a car on the other side, he wrote later, I felt even at the age of 71, that my life was beginning anew. His prison days were over. Mandela was driven with Winnie to City Hall in Cape Town. The crowd was so great that at first they could not get out of the car. As he stood in front of the crowd, he lifted his hand and said, Amarda Amandla. He told the crowd that apartheid had no future in South Africa and that talks between the government and the ANC were beginning. I therefore placed the remaining years of my life in your hands, he told the people. Mandela spent his first night of freedom at Archbishop Tutu's home in Cape Town. And then the next day he flew to Johannesburg. Thousands of people surrounded his old home in Orlando West. So they flew by helicopter to Soweto Stadium. There, there 120,000 people were waiting to welcome Mandela back to Soweto. He told the crowd, that his return to Suedo filled his heart with happiness. But he also felt a deep sadness because the suffering on the upper side was not over. But upper side would end soon and the violence in the townships must also end. The night Mandela returned to number 8115, Orlando West, people sang and danced outside the house. Full of happiness that he was home again, the four-roomed house had been rebuilt after the fire and at last, Mandela knew that his prison days were over. Soon after he was released, Mandela flew to Lusaka in Zambia to talk to the leaders of the ANC. And then he traveled to other countries in Africa. He went on to Stockholm to visit Oliver Tambo, who was seriously ill. Back in South Africa, Mandela was involved in talks with the leader of the Zulu people, Chief 
Putel Leji about the violence between Inkata and the Julu People's Group agency member, but in spite of their talk, the violence continued. Mandela traveled to the country and was told by the people that the police were involved in the violence. Mandela met with the President de Clark, asked him to do more to stop the violence. The ANC leaders continued to negotiate with the government about how to organize the new South Africa. Political difficulties Mandela faced were matched by personal difficulties. Winnie Mandela, after many years of suffering in Brentford, had returned to Johannesburg. In 1984, she became the leader of a group of young men called the, the Mandela United Football Club, which became more and more involved in violence. In 1989, several of these young men were involved in the murder of a 14-year-old boy, Stampy Sepe. NC leaders tried to stop Winnie's involvement with the violence, but she refused to listen to them. After he was released from prison, Mandela discovered that his wife had fallen in love with a young lawyer. In, in April 1992, with Walter Sisulu and Oliver Tambo by his side, Mandela told the world that he was uh, separating from his wife. His love for Winnie and her love for him had helped him to survive the long years in prison. He didn't blame his wife, and he had loved to sit inside, outside the prison from the moment he first met her. As people to understand the pain he had gone through, Mandela knew that the struggle for freedom had taken him, taken him away from his family. At the end of 1993, Nelson Mandela and President de Klerk were given the Nobel Peace Prize for their work of peace in South Africa. Mandela spoke about his dream of a new South Africa. Then he went on to speak about de Klerk. The president, he said, accepted the truth that the terrible suffering had been caused by apartheid and accepted that the government needed to negotiate. Later, de Klerk said that although Mandela had made mistakes. Most South Africans believed in him as a leader because he understood the fears and hopes of the nation. The journey towards freedom was not easy and uh, the violence continued. But on uh, 22nd April 1994, the first election for all people in South Africa took place. Among those who voted for the first time in their lives was the 90-year-old wife of the Nobel Peace Prize winner, Chief Lutuli. The violence stopped, and so people queued for eight hours in order to vote. One woman said, I've been waiting for 46 years. I don't mind waiting a little longer. It took several days for the votes to be counted. The ANC received nearly 63% of the votes, winning 252 of the 400 seats in the national parliament. Free at last, there is, this is a time to heal the old wounds and build a new South Africa, Mandela said. On 10th May, at Hard Autumn Day in Pretoria, Mandela became president of South Africa. With his daughter Jenny by his side, he promised to obey the laws of the new South Africa and to give himself to the people of South Africa. About 60 world leaders were there, including Nayere from Tanzania and Kaunda from Zambia. The Brutus Brutus Gali from the United Nations was there. Hillary Clinton and Jesse Jackson were there from the US. A crowd of 60,000 people sang the two national songs. The African song of the years of Africa, more than 300 years of white government ended. The long struggle for freedom was over. The end.